time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening. This is David Ross. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Robert Colborn, an editor of Business Week magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Paul C. Abersold, director of the Isotopes Division of the United States Atomic Energy Commission. Mr. Abersold, you, of course, have just arrived from that fabulous place, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and I believe you've spent most of your adult life in atomic energy, so I'm sure that you're equipped to give our viewers an up-to-the-minute report on developments in the atomic energy field. First of all, sir, can you illustrate simply for us uh, how extensive the atomic energy program is today? Well, the atomic energy program is big business. It's about uh, as large as any of the largest corporations in the United States at the present time. When our expansion program is complete... Not uh, quite as big as U.S. Steel. Not right? quite as big as U.S. Steel, but it'll be about $8 billion uh, at the end of this expansion period, which means about $200 or more per family uh, invested. In Each other words, every American family now has $200 invested in atomic energy. That's a total of about $8 billion. That's right. Everybody how, many, how many people are working for it now? About 100,000 people uh, work on the program and operations. And construction, there's a large... Those people are directly working for the government. These people don't work for the government. Uh, only about 6,000 people work for the Atomic Energy Commission itself, so that most of the work is actually done by private industrial contractors. Well, is, is atomic energy a, a government monopoly at the moment? Well, in some senses it is, because legally uh, certain functions are, can only be done by, by under government supervision. But the Commission is exploring ways of having certain phases of atomic energy program taken over by private enterprises. Now, what are your specific responsibilities in the program, sir? Well, I'm concerned with peacetime applications or byproducts of atomic energy called radioisotopes. These are radioactive atoms that we make at Oak Ridge with the reactor. Can you explain that a little more, Mr. Ebersole? Well, of course, that's a technical yeah. term, but I think it'll become as popular someday as radio, television, all of the terms that were technical at one well, can time. You, can you show our viewers just what, can you illustrate just what an isotope is. Yes, they're radioactive atoms. I have a couple of bottles here. This is a bottle of radioactive iodine. This is a bottle of radioactive phosphorus. And we can make radioactive forms of all the elements around us here. Right, if that bottle of iodine is just like any other iodine, except some of the atoms in it uh, give off radiation. Yes, by radioactive I mean that they give off rays, atomic rays that uh, and are you can like detect those with an instrument. Like those from radium and, and uh, X-ray machines and so on. These give off similar radiations. All right, now what can you do with that bottle of iodine that you couldn't do with a bottle of ordinary iodine? Well, these, uh, these radioactive iodine atoms uh, can be traced because of the atomic rays that they give off. One can follow them with atomic instruments. You can follow extremely small quantities of radioactive atoms. You can follow as small as a billion billionth of an ounce. Well, now, what does, that mean, what does that mean in, re in medical research, for instance? Sir? Well, they're called tracer atoms because we can put these into a biological uh, system, I mean a plant or an animal or a man even, and trace where these atoms go. For well, example, if I, if I swallowed that bottle, uh, the iodine would go to my thyroid just the same as if it were ordinary iodine. It would behave in your system just the same chemically and physically, uh, just like iodine. And uh, your body doesn't know the difference, except that it gives off rays and you can find out where it, where it is. Those atoms are saying, look, I'm iodine atoms, I'm here in your thyroid gland. And to the scientist, then you can tell where they are. Uh, and also, if I happen to need some rays in my thyroid, as I might if it were too big. That's right. Uh, there are two I uses. Get a treatment. There are two uses for these things. One is as tracer atoms, in which you use very, very small amounts to find out where these atoms are going. The other is to use them as sources of radiation to, uh, to Just produce... Just like X-ray. Like X-ray, <laughs> to treat or to uh, do something in industry, like take pictures and so on so that you can use the, the radiation uh, in a Before practical they get their way. Well, now, how much however, use is made of these radioactive isotopes now? Very many people using them? Well, there are over a thousand uh, institutions in the United States that uh, are using isotopes, and we've shipped out about 40,000 shipments all over the these country. These would be hospitals and laboratories? Hospitals, research laboratories, and now several hundred uh, industrial companies how are making... How industrial company use it? Well, they again use them in two ways. One for research to find out uh, mechanisms or how things act, uh, what atoms are doing, and all kinds of processes. Well, how would you s 
Say, what could you find out about an engine? With? Well, you could, for example, we, you could send us a piston ring, uh, and we could put it in our reactor at Oak Ridge, and the atomic rays in the reactor will make this piston ring radioactive. When you put in a motor, when the uh, piston goes up and down, you wear off a little bit of radioactive iron. We can detect that way as little as a hundred thousandths of an ounce of wear from the piston ring while the motor's running. Now, you couldn't find that much if... Uh, that much wear if it weren't radioactive. You, it would take you months to get the same answer on comparing one lubricating oil with another or uh, comparing high-speed operation of a motor with low speed, whereas with a radioactive piston ring, you can get this information in a matter of hours. That yeah. is, I put this piston ring in, run it for an hour or so with one oil, run it for an hour or so with another oil, and from the amount of the radioactive stuff that comes through, I can tell which oil is wearing it more. That's right, and you can do it without ever opening the motor uh, and making no uh, tests. I mean, you don't have to change the conditions at all. What are you contributing to cancer research? Well, I'm glad you asked that because we've had a very active program. The commission not only distributes isotopes for cancer research at reduced uh, prices, uh, they're, they're to about 500 hospitals around the country, uh, but the commission itself has a large number of research contracts in fundamental uh, biology and medicine, uh, several hundred contracts uh, in universities and research institutions throughout the country. So the commission has had a very active program to uh, help in cancer research. Well, now, what about agricultural research? Is, are these isotopes useful in agricultural research? Well, they're used in all fields of research. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, agriculture, pure science, and uh, medicine and industry. Now, in agriculture, uh, they're largely used as tracer atoms, that is, to find out how a plant uh, utilizes fertilizer from the soil, or how the plant uh, takes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and uh, makes sugar. I'd like to go back to this cancer thing a bit, uh, Mr. Aber. So, uh, are people curing cancer with isotopes? Well, the word cure isn't uh, very uh, popular in the cancer field because uh, it's difficult to say that you've had a complete cure. But people can... Uh, be alleviated of the disease, the symptoms of the disease can uh, be uh, reduced uh, so that people can live longer and live more comfortably. That is, you can get uh, radiation to, uh, to a cancer with uh, isotopes more easily than you can with x-ray in some cases. We, can ha we have machines that have been made using radioactive cobalt, for example, which gives off a million volt rays, rays of a million volts of energy it's uh, like very high-powered x-ray. That's right, like a very high-powered x-ray, except now, much cheaper. What about the uh, security and secrecy in this field? So you have shipped these isotopes uh, overseas to all the free world, haven't you? That's right. Uh, in other words, our government is not imposing any security in this field. They, mm -hmm. We are sharing the peacetime knowledge and uses of, of atomic energy uh, with the rest of the world. That's right. We're very happy that in this particular field that there, there, there is not any security. These atoms are just like atoms of ordinary elements, except they're radioactive. There are other people in the world now who make uh, radioisotopes. There are reactors, or these atomic ovens, as we call them, in many other countries today. Well, now, coming back to the uh, atomic energy program in general, sir, uh, where was the free world hurt did we suffer from, from uh, the atomic espionage? Well, certainly we did, but I'm happy to say that I don't believe that there are any U.S. scientists of any note that were involved. I think that uh, our own security program was very well handled and is being well handled today. Now, you recognize or you, that, we, that there's still great need for secrecy uh, as far as the weapons uh, development program. In weapons development, there's a need for secrecy, but even there, uh, there's a philosophy Is that... Is it possible to overdo secrecy to, so that it restricts your own development? It does. It can. Uh, therefore, there's a philosophy that uh, security... Another phase of security is security by accomplishment. The more you can accomplish, keep ahead of the other fellow, do it faster. And uh, we can do more that way by as much information as we can release that will help our own science and technology will further our... The two our kinds of security can contradict each other to some extent. You can have uh, security by secrecy, and you need some of that, particularly in weapons and military applications. But if you overdo that, you're restricting your own scientific progress. Well, now, how much is the atomic energy program going to affect the life of the average American in our lifetime, sir? Well, it will uh, not revolutionize our lifetime because we've already had a revolution in technology in this country in the last uh, 50 years. Uh, so that it's hard to say that atomic energy is going to revolutionize things. But it will uh, be a, it's a powerful new uh, source of energy. Uh, there will be uh, atomic power for uh, useful purposes uh, within the next decade, certainly. 
Uh, these uh, research uses with present fuels like coal. Or well, not competing, oil but supplementing. Power. I think that they won't. Uh, atomic power won't replace the coal or oil, but it will supplement. And many uh, there will be many uses for this power. Well, now you mentioned that we now have about eight billion dollars invested in the atomic energy program. Now, is most of that uh, waste? I mean, is most of that in in weapons or in material that can be used only for weapons? I'm glad you asked that because. Actually, only about 15% or something like that of our expenditures are on a purely military uh, program uh, in which uh, you might not get anything back. But about 75% of the uh, effort is in making this atomic explosives, uh, fissionable material we call them, well, uranium, get anything back. uranium and plutonium. And those can be used, that, uh, that material can be used for useful power. And it's, it's stored How there. How would you do that, Mr. Anderson? Well, you see, this doesn't decay rapidly. Plutonium and uranium don't decay rapidly, and they're just as good as gold, except that they are a source of energy. So we're storing up a future potential source of energy. Well, now, as a final question, sir, uh, most Americans have heard it said that maybe atomic energy was going to be the device by which we just destroyed all human life on this planet. Uh, do you feel that... Uh, the program is going to end an eventual destruction of human life, or do you think that it may be an agency by which uh, human life is made better for everyone in the world? Well, I don't think man was put here to destroy himself, and I think that our stockpile of atomic weapons is really uh, a great thing for national security. I don't think other nations will uh, risk uh, war with us. We, as long as we keep foremost in the atomic energy, atomic weapon field, it's a very great thing for national security. And well, in the long run, I think uh, there'd be greater contributions from the peacetime aspects than from the military. Well, thank you very much for being with us this evening, sir, and this has been very reassuring. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Robert Colborn, an editor of Business Week magazine. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Paul C. Abersold, Director of the Isotopes Division of the United States Atomic Energy Commission. You know, uh, buying a Longines is like acquiring a watch custom made to your individual order. We have always recognized that those who buy a watch of Longines quality expect such exclusiveness. And among the many hundreds of models which we produce each year, there is a Longines made just for you. Of your Longines, as of every Longines, it can be said, this is the world's most honored watch. For every Longines watch is made with that meticulous care that has won for Longines 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 Gold Medal Awards, and highest official honors for accuracy from the great observatories. Yet, unbelievably, you may buy the Longines made just for you for as little as $71.50. So if you are interested in buying just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, choose Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at the same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is David Ross reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. See Jane Pullman's USA Canteen on the CBS Television Network.